Hello and welcome to episode 176 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, before we start, I must apologise, I've got a, um, a beautiful bit of bird song going in the, on in the background, but it might be quite annoying for you and for the listener. Yeah, I do apologise about that. Can you hear it? Uh, well, no, I, as, uh, it's, it's a blackbird. If people listen um, carefully, if it does sing, it's a blackbird. I can tell from here, even though I'm... Um, probably sixty miles away, but because I am, I am a bit of a closet twitcher. I do, I do like birds, and so uh, yeah, I can tell it's a blackbird. But yeah, leave it in there. It's we we we've, we've had a bit of spring, so why why not? Anyway, enough of the billoddy stuff. It's um great to have you back, my friend. You've you've been away, and obviously we've been away for a week. What what have you been up to? Well, I turned forty uh last week so my twin and i and our respective partners we went to new york for a, a few days to celebrate the the milestone i've never been to new york it's a place i've always wanted to go to and yeah we had a fab time it was it was it was great to get away without the kids for the first time in ages and just spend a few days wandering the streets of new york you feel like you've, all, you've already been there because there's so much of it we see on tv and yeah i wandered around did all the sites the empire state building if you ever go there go up the empire state building at night it's particularly impressive uh yeah did a helicopter ride that was one of my presents and yeah there's lots of surprises along the way people who rocked up who i didn't expect to like family members and friends so yeah it was brilliant andy so i'd like to thank everybody who wished me happy birthday as well during the trip there's a lot of people who are podcast listeners uh, people who use the website or 8020 investor members who got in touch via email and twitter and facebook to, to wish me happy birthday which is fantastic it's really nice to have people wishing you happy birthday who you've never met so there is a picture or one or two pictures in new york on our facebook page that i put up there if only for the comedy value that my brother and i seem to accidentally wear the same outfit every night we went out and uh, as twins it just seemed like we were trying to do it and it's a it's an occupational hazard of being a twin that you can go somewhere and wear exactly the same color top or something similar and uh, yes we did that a number of times so it was brilliant so I'm back in the UK and I'm not too jet lagged but there are some themes from that trip that i wanted to put on the podcast that are relevant actually in terms of holiday money and currencies and etc etc so we'll talk about that but one thing i did do i did visit wall street while i was out there and saw the charging ball or the raging ball i think it's called down in wall street and actually the rather lonely fearless girl which is the other statue that's with the ball which i had my picture taken next to you couldn't get anywhere near the ball itself because there seemed to be a million uh, Japanese tourists by the busload who just went there, were smothering it, and were cupping its balls at the back. Apparently that's, I think, luckily, <laughs> lucky or something. But there was this very, very um, different behaviour. So you, I didn't actually get a picture of me with that, which would have been nice, but the rather lonely, fearless girl I did. So uh, how about you, Andy, before we crack on? Are you are you okay? You're looking good. The beard's reduced in size, I noticed. Yeah, I'm doing all right, thanks. Yeah, the beard's reduced in size. I've used the uh, the week off that we had to uh, get myself a bit more trim. So, yeah, I've been losing a bit of weight. Managed to shift nearly a stone in the couple of weeks that we've been away, which is, uh, yeah, crazy, really. But, yeah, apart from that, I'm not really doing a lot. Oh, I bought a new bed as well, and it probably cost me more than your trip to New York. So the less, <laughs> the less said about that, the better. So I like the fact that we're going to sort of post holiday blues. So to get you back into the mood of holidays, we're going to, we're going to keep on the holiday theme and we're going to talk about money and travel money and things like that. So what do you want to start with this week? Well, I think it was a couple of episodes ago, we started talking about the ways to take money abroad. And I don't talk about particular products on this show that i love but i i will talk about the revolute card that i did use while i was out there now this is one of the cards that you can use it's a prepaid card that i spoke about a couple of weeks ago and i at that point i said i hadn't used it but i live and die by the sword of what we talk about and so i went out there and used it as my means of taking currency to america now part of the positives around it come from my niece actually she's an air steward with british airways and she uses this card now the revolute card the reason I liked it after I used it and I would 
recommend it. I, I mean, if you if you work for Revolut, you're not allowed to use these words, by the way. I'm just <laughs> saying it for the listeners out there. It's because you charge the card up with money and you can do it any time. So I actually was in a restaurant and put money on the card. I actually got the bill at one time, saw how much it was, put money on the card via the app on my smartphone the money appeared instantly on the card and then I could give it to the person to pay the bill that's how quickly it happens and not only that by the time the person had put the card through the machine and had taken the cost of the the meal that I was eating I immediately got notified via the app and my Apple watch notification the exact cost of the meal that had been deducted and you get a live feed of how much money you've got on your prepaid card so that is in my mind incredible technology now the way it works is that you can put money on the card in any currency there's a, there's a whole load of currencies that they have and the tip is that you go on there and you exchange when you put the money on the card you exchange it into the currency you want so in my case it would have been dollars but don't do that if you if you have the card there's a tip here don't do that you can just put money on the card in sterling so that means it's just sitting there but what happens when you go and buy something you get the exchange rate at the exact moment you purchase the item so in and that exchange rate is the one that you see if you just google it it's not with any fees or anything like that so to give you an example if you went to the post office last week so this is comparing it you would have got 127 so one dollar 27 to the pound with the revolute card you would get near a 140 so it's the exact rate obviously while i was doing that i did fall foul of the fact that the pound plummeted last week so if i'd locked into my dollar which i could have done on the card and just had dollars sitting on the card i would have actually had more money by the end of it because by the time i was out it started to fall but the reason i say i used it in that particular way of only putting money on when i was particularly going to use it is because there have been issues that with revolute that the it's not a bank it's actually a, a technology firm so it's a it's an app in in, in in a sense so unlike your credit card if somebody robs your credit card you can then easily generally get the money back with a revolute card there have been people who my niece who works uh, as, a, as an air stewardess as i said they there have been people who have struggled to get the money back if the card has been uh, cloned and used elsewhere so it's one of those things it's just more of a hassle to get the money back so why bother you can just put the money on as and when you need it like i said it happens so quickly and it's also contactless so i was a it's a product that i used and as I said, I, I really liked it. And the exchange rates are better than pretty much anything you're going to find out there. And uh, yeah, it's so easy to use. Charge up, put money on, take money off, etc. So um, it was just one of those thumbs up for something that I use. So anyway, one of the next pieces I'm going to talk about in a bit, not right now, is about the exchange rate for the pounds. So we're going to date the podcast slightly. But when we're talking about holiday money... What happened to me about the exchange rates moving? There'd be a lot of people out there thinking, well, if I was to do the same as you, Damien, I'd want to have a sort of a reassurance that the pound's not going to plummet or where it's going to go. So um, is it worth locking in now or in the future? So I'm going to do a little bit on that. So Damien, you mentioned how easy it was to top up that uh, Revolut card. If you, if you end up topping it up by too much and there's money left on there, I take it you can just pull the money back on that on that day's exchange rate if you haven't converted it over? Well, what you can do is you can actually just spend it in the in, in the UK. Oh, okay. And, and the other thing is one you can transfer money from one, one Revolut cardholder to another. So if there's somebody else you know who's going to go somewhere and use a currency, then you could technically give them the money and they just give you cash in the real world. But yeah, you could change it back from one currency to another. You can keep moving the money around, but you can't withdraw back down onto your current account. So the money's on the card. But like you say, you only top it up as you go along. There's no mechanism as far as I'm aware that you can you can pull it back. But there are ways around it. I'm just intrigued as well in terms of, um, you say you, you topped it up on your smartphone there. Did you get any sort of a, a package or deal in terms of access to internet and phone and stuff like that? I haven't been abroad for so long, like properly abroad, to somewhere like America. Has it all opened up now? Can you just use your phone abroad without much cost? Or was you connected to Wi-Fi? What was the situation? situation i'm just intrigued do you know what the, the the scenario in europe while we're still in europe is pretty easy you can use your phone as and when you please to all intents and purposes we covered it on the podcast previously so go back and find that one but largely you can use your phone pretty much like you do at home when you go to europe but in america it's very different now for example a, two of the people who were on the trip their phones just pretty much ceased working in america 
and they couldn't really receive calls or anything when they were outside of the hotel, not using the Wi-Fi to make calls via things like WhatsApp. So you still have to make a, make allowances and probably notify your mobile phone provider. But the charges are still expensive. You do go in America. You go through the data like there's no tomorrow. And um, there were one of the people on the on, on the group bought cheaper packages on their phone to get data. But they were going through the data at such a rapid rate that they were spending like thirty dollars a day. And a lot of that is because of the apps in the background that are using the data. So if you're going to use it, I I, I said to them just turn the cellular stuff off so the data isn't being used. Now I'm on a package where I get all you can eat kind of included data and also it, it does give me data for america okay well. so i can use my phone i can use my phone pretty much anywhere in the world without having to pay additional cost for it and it comes in at about 40 pound ish a month which is quite expensive but it's only because i've had to use it different places when i work so i've tethered up with my computer as well so but I did get a message from my provider who told me if I hadn't had that deal, my bill when I came back would have been, I think it was £1,300, wow. which, I, which I was quite I was quite impressed at because I was on my phone like doing Google Maps and finding places all the time. So if you are going to be traveling around, Europe is a different cut of fish. But if you do venture to America, be careful about the data. And I would suggest you turn, obviously, data roaming off. But if you do buy any of the packages, I think you should, again, turn data roaming on and off sporadically and the the cellular data usage otherwise you'll probably get stung for quite a bit okay so we went straight in there on the travel bits and pieces but there are a couple of other bits coming up on the show and we haven't mentioned those yet what what else have we got look one of the things is interest rates there's going to be a bit of a movement on what's going to happen with interest rates and ultimately your mortgage rate in the uk which i'll want to touch upon and that leads quite nicely into a another piece that i want to chat on regarding the outlook for the pound versus the dollar and the euro so basically holiday money and then finally i want to have uh talk about investing an 80 20 investor and in, and, and what i'm investing in basically and uh, a bit of a uh, a new feature that came in that a lot of this had a lot of positive feedback from members i did something a bit different so we'll start with the interest rate piece i think so i'll go straight into that one andy interest rates before about a week or so ago the rate of interest so the bank of england base rate was predicted to go up in may so that's by the time you're listening to this podcast if you're listening to it at the point it's released that and that's in the next week, the rate of interest in the UK was is meant to go up. So the next week or so, you were going to see rates go up. But there has been a bit of a shift because while they previously thought we were going to have a rate rise in May and possibly the end later on in the year, so at least two in 2018, which is why it, it's a good idea to start thinking about whether you want to fix your mortgage or not. The economic data we've seen recently has come in a bit softer, so it's a bit below where they thought it would be. Now, the Q1, so the first three months of 2018, the economic data, so the GDP, the growth in the UK was a bit below where analysts expected it to be. Now, they partly blamed that cold snap we had. And if you wonder why, it's because if, if it's snowing and no one goes out, they don't spend anything in the shops and they also don't tend to go and buy any sort of particularly spring-like clothes or anything in the shops they tend to delay purchases so it ends up hitting the economy and also a lot of people didn't probably go to work and for that reason it it knocked the uk economic growth forecast and the other thing is inflation came in at a slightly lower rate than previously expected so i think inflation now is it was it was around 2.9 2.7 percent but it was a it came in lower than analysts were expecting now that means that when mark carney and the bank of england look at rate whether they're going to raise rates they raise rates if they think inflation is going up and if the economy is looking good so it doesn't overheat so going back to that analogy with cars it's like when you're changing gears in the car you only change up a gear when the engine revs are ticking along nicely and the car is moving along at a, at a pace if there's any danger that the revs are falling or the speed's coming down and you might stall you're never going to move up a gear because you're going to stall the car interest rate movements are the same so with a slight slowing down or a, a growth that isn't as good as what they uh, as analysts had hoped and the bank of england had hoped and with inflation maybe coming in a little bit lower it's a sign that maybe things are cooling down and the economy isn't doing as well as they thought so they are less likely to move or raise interest rates now to put some numbers 
on that. About two weeks ago, the market was pricing in a 90% certainty that interest rates were going to be moved up in May. So probably towards something like 0.75%. Now, the rate or the sort of odds of it happening in May are 6%. Oh, wow. So it's, it's, it's like negligible. And it's a huge swing. Now, the market is very bad at predicting and guessing when interest rates will go up or, in fact, go down. And Mark Carney has been making some noises out there saying that the market shouldn't be obsessing about the timing of these rates. So he didn't say the rates weren't going to... The rate rises, sorry. He didn't say the rate rises weren't going to happen in 2018, but the exact timing. So... There's been a slight reprieve for mortgage borrowers. Savers out there will probably be sitting there feeling rather frustrated, but they will be coming. Now, for you, when you're listening to the news, always look for what Mark Carney's saying when you hear a bit of news, what his rhetoric is, whether he's being slightly bullish and talking up the economy, because that may be an indication that the committee as a whole are feeling that rates should be going up. They want to put them up if they can. They want to get back to normality, but the chances are they won't. So, Keep an eye on job numbers, the inflation data, and any sort of economic figures. And they tend to come out in the middle of the month. So if you look about the 12th, 13th, 14th, or 15th of every month, around about that time, you will see inflation figures and unemployment figures be announced. And people look at those closely because they are good indicators of how healthy the economy is. Good, interesting. Okay, so how does that lead into the holiday money bit we were saying about? The reason it's linked is because the fact that interest rates, whether they go up or down, has a direct impact on the value of the pound. So there are lots of factors that influence the strength of a currency. But if you think of it like, uh, let's pretend a currency is like a a current account. So if an account is paying a good rate of interest, there's a lot of demand for it. And it's a bit like a currency. If there's a good rate of interest on it, so basically Bank of England is paying a decent rate of interest, there'll be a demand for it. It's very... Overly simplistic, but uh, analogy. But that's that's pretty much how it how it works. So, taking what I just spoke about in the previous piece and about the Bank of England looking less likely now to raise interest rates, the market suddenly started pricing in the idea that they probably won't for a little while, and certainly the rate of these changes or hikes will slow. And so, therefore, that made the prospect for the pound fall. So they were saying, well, there isn't going to be rate rises at quite the aggressive rate we thought. So the pound is overvalued, so it started to drop. Now, the drop went from about $141 down to 136 That doesn't sound a lot, but it's a huge amount. I mean, let's put it into perspective. Before Brexit, we were at 150 So $1.50. We then plummeted all the way down to 140 130 and then down to 120 as a result of Brexit because that was how poor the prospects were for our economy after the vote but we 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 then slowly started to climb up into the 130s and 135 and then we suddenly bounced all the way up to 141 and that was about two weeks ago which is over and it wasn't two weeks actually it was just over a week ago the pound was at the highest rate against the dollar since the brexit vote so that was nearly two years ago now and that was at the point which I went to America. And I should have locked into my dollars, but I didn't. <laughs> and as a result of Mark Carney's rhetoric, the uh, economic data that came in, and the fact that interest rates don't look like they might, they're going to go up in May, the value of the pound started to drop. And that started to go through certain key levels, resistance levels they talk about, so where people would naturally start to buy back because they think the pound's becoming undervalued, etc. So there are certain levels, a bit like equities we talk about, it happens on currency markets. So in short, what does that mean for your holiday money? Is it going to bounce back to 140? Well, we've now got down to the point of 136, and we were just above that, but $1.36 is quite a key level if we go down below that then we're likely to go to 135 and possibly even lower so for those people looking to go on holiday you don't want to play the currency markets it's a a bit of a uh, a loser's game you're never going to get it but you are intrigued as to when you might want to buy currency $1.38 at the moment is an interesting point if we start seeing the pound go back above that then there's a case for the pound perhaps strengthening even more Again, getting back towards that 140, 141 level. But if it keeps falling, it doesn't get above there, then it's likely to continue to weaken. So 
that's a level to keep an eye on if you're thinking about buying your dollars. Interestingly, we've also talked about in investing about the 10-year treasury yield. If you if you go back to podcasts, we talk about it a fair bit to do with investing and in particular equities and about uh, it rising and it get, and it actually broke above the 3% level, which was a key level and it started to cause wobbles in the equity market. Now, if you look at that, that yield level, that's a bit similar again to interest rates on it is an interest rate on a bond effectively and if those rates go up it means that the dollar becomes more attractive and becomes stronger so what you want to see is if those if you keep an eye on that level if that level starts going up and we start seeing that go that 10-year treasury yield going above three percent it probably means that the dollar is going to start strengthening which therefore will mean that the pound will it continue to weaken because if the dollar strengthens the pound weaken so it's again just an interesting fact that some a throwaway out there for people to look at to keep an eye on so if that level keeps going up it probably doesn't bode that well for the pound and like i said that one dollar 38 if you're going to europe then the movement in the currency markets in europe and the pound have been so the euro to the pound have been a little bit less exciting they've been kind of consolidating for a while so I can't shed too much light on where what might happen there. At the moment, we seem to be kind of range bound. So it is what it is. I don't think you're going to get anything much better or worse for a period of time. But I could be wrong. If you're listening to this in the future and um, Donald Trump's pressed the button, then uh, I hope you're enjoying your uh, $3.75 to the pound. <laughs> Interestingly, Donald Trump does influence currencies a hell of a lot because of the trade issues they're having with China. So he's constantly trying to start a trade war and it causes people to start thinking about the health of certain economies and people f sort of sell riskier assets. So it does have influences on currency markets too. So yeah, Donald Trump does influence everything that you do, unfortunately. He influences your probably your net worth, um, your sleep at night and even your holiday money. Before we move on, Andy, I just wanted to quickly mention 8020 Investor. Now, 8020 Investor is my DIY investment service. Do go and check it out. I empower and teach people how to invest their own money. The service provides data driven fund tables. The data is driven by my own unique 8020 Investor algorithm, which I created. You also get stop loss alerts, you get research articles and insights, you get market commentaries, monthly commentaries and DIY investment lessons but you also get access to my £50,000 portfolio which is a portfolio of my own money which I run live on the site for members to see and it shows people how I use the service to uh, maximise my returns and in the first two years of doing so I turned £50,000 into £59,500 which is a 19% a return beating investment managers, professional fund managers, financial advisors, investment banks, passive trackers and the market. So everybody can have a free 30-day trial of 8020 Investor and you can claim that by going to moneytothemasses.com and going and clicking on the 8020 Investor hyperlink at the top of the page. So go and try the service, let me know what you think of it and I, I know from the feedback that you're going to love it. But for now, on with the show. Okay, so the little ad that we played there, your lovely dulcet tones there, Damien, explaining what 8020 Investor is and what it does. Uh, we're going to move on to a piece and we're going to talk about just that, 8020 Investor. What, what have you got for us? The first thing I just want to mention is that last week we talked about funds for a downturn and it was great to have a, an email from an 8020 Investor member who the research I, I, I did that it was the basis of the piece in last week's podcast about the, the funds for the downturn. The funds that I actually mentioned in the, the research piece that 8020 investor members saw, that actually, they, the person wrote in to say that was great and that they'd made a tidy profit from those funds because they actually some of them were short in the market, which is great to hear because 8020 investor isn't just about doing momentum trades and uh, it, it's about the wider education of trying to. Uh, how you understand what funds to buy and when. But this week, what I did is I, I, I did something different on 8020 Investor. Now, people will know that I run a portfolio of my own funds of £50,000 on 8020 Investor. And I, and I run it live. So when I make changes, I tell people so I can show them the actual return that I make. So to date, that's just over 25% in three years, which I'm obviously pleased with. And in, in recent months, we've taken a little bit of risk off the table. Not much. I'm still invested 
in equities and probably about half the portfolio is and then the rest is in other assets and just damien to give that some context yeah. um not only is that a really impressive result in terms of returns but in terms of who else is doing that out there as far as you're concerned we're concerned it's pretty much unique isn't it people don't t- tend to put their money where their mouth is no they don't and the reason is because it's far easier just to say uh be a talking head and not do that because the thing is it, you it can go wrong and you can make a bet look at neil woodford one of the most famous fund managers who everybody thought walked on water is now going through a bad patch everyone does everyone will do but of course you do that and you stake a reputation on it that's the unfortunate thing that if you if you believe in something then you should do it so yeah i'd question anybody if you go for a financial advisor uh, go see a financial advisor how do they invest their money where do they do it do they follow their own advice it's very good to and very easy to trot their own advice out but do they follow it themselves and also fund managers often don't invest in their own funds they can do some do some don't and uh, i do wonder why they wouldn't if they really believed in it but yeah so what i do is i I run that money and i am very conscious of the fact that um, while it's not intended for people to look at and copy that some people may be inclined to do so so i always try and keep it at like a very medium risk level and even though there would be times where i would take more risk personally because i've got a very long investment time frame and that's a slight frustration in there because it would be good to show people what you could obviously make if you want to take more or less risk don't forget risk isn't one way you don't just take more risk and make more money you can lose money but of course i've had people email me and say what would you do if you wanted to take more risk because obviously your portfolio is sort of medium risk and also i have people who say that oh i've outperformed what you're doing it's great using the 80 20 stuff and and of course other members don't see that they don't see the range that you can achieve they just they they start to overly focus on what i'm doing the idea is that i provide the tools for people to do their own thing so taking that all in the round what i did is i created a new portfolio that was high risk and i also did one that was low risk and the way i did it is i could have just gone back in time and picked a portfolio but there was a danger that you could be accused of cherry picking so what i did is i went back and the trades that i actually did for my fifty thousand pound portfolio in real life they're all there they're all um, in history the units etc have been bought and they can replicate those what i did is use that is the basis of those portfolios using the idea that the high risk portfolio for example would only invest in the medium risk funds and the high risk funds in the same level of conviction that i had for my ordinary portfolio so they, if there were certain funds that were getting more exposure they would get even greater exposure in the high risk if you want to know more about the methodology and then take a free trial and you can read it but what it, reason i want to mention it because it got such fantastic feedback and the high risk portfolio i talked about 25 percent on my portfolio you would have got 32.63 percent and it isn't i say high i should caveat that with the word higher because obviously higher you could go and shoot the lights out and just invest in china but higher risk actually invest in some medium risk stuff so there is still a bit of bonds and stuff in there but also a bit more skew towards the higher end and that would have meant that my 50 grand portfolio would be worth 66,000 pounds now compared to the 62 and a half that is with my Damien's portfolio so so it was just a new piece of research that showed people how you can get a range of returns and utilize risk to try and amplify those returns of course in a market where it could plummet then there's obviously the more risk you take the more you stand to lose and what I want to just finish on because if you're intrigued by that, then do go and have a have a look at 8020 Investor. But what I wanted to finish on was to give people some value to suggest, well, or to tell them where is the high portfolio concentrated? What are the areas? Now, I'm not going to tell you the percentages, obviously, because that's what 8020 Investor is for, or the entire portfolio. But I'm going to give you five key areas that it has probably slightly more exposure than a typical portfolio than my ordinary portfolio and their first one is u.s equities but more towards u.s tech equities and that's been reined in recently it's come in a bit but that is one area china chinese equities is another asian equities generally it is there's a slight skew there and and japan as well japanese equities but in particular there is also a, a fairly decent exposure to uk smaller companies now Partly that's come around as a result of 
a lot of the uncertainty out there. Now, trade wars are very bad for companies who trade over across country borders, but for smaller companies, they tend to be quite insular. They tend to be domestic orientated, and as a result, they've they've fared quite well in the recent environment. So that's why that's that's gone there. What you'll notice there's an absence of Europe, and at the moment there has been an absence of European equities for my portfolio for quite a while. So anyway, that's just a a, a tip bit of what's in that high risk portfolio, and for people who are maybe thinking about looking at something some ideas there are some ideas to look at but high risk can be high reward but in obviously in a, in a market that can be a little bit volatile you've got to expect at that uptick in volatility so there we go Andy I'm conscious of the time and I think I think we've covered everything you have indeed it's been really good this week lots of tidbits and bits of information and yeah if you want to find out more about um, 8020 investor do get involved with that. Damien offers a free trial. You heard it in the advert. Go and check it out. 8020 Investor. Good. If you want to get in touch with Damien about anything else, of course you can do it. at money to the masses with a number two. That's his Twitter. And if you want to get in touch by email, it's Damien at money to the masses dot com. And of course, if you want to review the podcast, please do so. It really helps us get up the iTunes charts. And actually on that subject of reviews, we haven't had many recently. So if you want to have your review read out on the podcast, please do get along there and review podcast. You can also get yourself a free book if you do so. And uh, you'll hear more about that at the very end of the podcast. Damien, that's pretty much it, isn't it? That is it, Andy. We'll be back next week as normal. No more weeks off. You're back at it, Andy. <laughs> I'm back at it. Yeah, well, we both are. We both are. No more resting. Don't forget to claim your free copy of Damien's best-selling book, The 30-Day Money Play. Sort your finances in just five minutes a day, worth $4.99. Just go to moneytothemasses.com slash podcast to find out how.